You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Welcome back to Modern Musicology. My name is Alan, and I've got at least one of my co-hosts with me this week, Anthony. Hi there. Unfortunately, Rob is not able to join us tonight, and Stephanie is also not here because her husband, Bob, has had back surgery, and he is in recovery, and she is taking care of him. So, Bob, we love you. Wish you all the best. We hope your recovery is easy. But we have two excellent guests with us this week, two of the founding members of one of my absolute favorite bands, Heart. They can be heard on hits like Magic Man, Crazy on You, Dreamboat Annie, Barracuda, Love Alive, Dog and Butterfly, Even It Up, and a lot more. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2013. Welcome bass player Steve Fawson and drummer Michael DeRozier. How are you gentlemen doing tonight? Doing fine. Doing great. That's fantastic. Uh, these gentlemen played in the original lineup of Heart, of course, for the first six albums from 75 to 82. But Steve, you go back much farther than that. This is a band that you actually founded back in 1967 under the name The Army. So can you talk a little bit about those early days, about starting the band with Roger Fisher, and what was the band like before Ann and Nancy got involved? Okay, so Roger and I, we uh, met in homeroom back in, when we were in eighth grade, because he was a Fisher and I was a Fawson, so we would put us in the same homeroom. Right. And we became friends, and we found out that we shared a love of, of rock music, and so for the next three years that's all we talked about was rock music and talked about songs and uh, what bands we liked and blah 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 and uh, then when we got to high school we said heck what the heck let's get instruments and start our journey so um, and then for the next two years he practiced his instrument and I practiced my instrument and we kind of did our thing separately from each other and then when we were seniors in 1967, we met at my father's house. We shook hands and we said, let's start a band. And we're not stopping until we make it big. Can you talk a little bit about meeting Anne for the first time and when she came into the band? One of the questions that our co-host Stephanie had is she's really curious to know about the evolution of the band and how... Anne and Nancy coming in changed the trajectory of, of what you guys were already doing. Okay. Well, okay. So when, when Raj and I first started the band, it was a four piece, all male um, drummer. Uh, we had a keyboard player who also played guitar and, and sang. And that was the, the band for three or four years. And then, um, and then those, uh, the drummer and the, and, the keyboard player quit and we had another couple of different uh, member changes in the meantime. And then uh, Roger and I put an ad in the paper. We were looking for a lead singer, a guitar player and a drummer. And uh, Ann Wilson answered the ad in the paper and she happened to know a uh, drummer or sh she played with a drummer and a, another guitar player. And she had a, actually had a male singer too at the same time. So when we all joined forces. It was a six piece band with a female lead singer, a male lead singer, Roger and I, uh, a guitar player and a drummer. And other than we were able to play music that featured a female voice, the, the music was not all that different. I mean, we played the, it was back then you, bands played cover music and the, goal was to get people up and dancing and having a good time so we we played all the hits of the day and some of the classic stuff that you know people love 
over the past, you know, at the time we met Anne, it was 1971. So you can imagine we played uh, Love the One You're With and uh, we did some Janis Joplin and uh, Dusty Springsfield and stuff like that. Plus we did a lot of male songs too, because the singer that we had was really good at, uh, he could sing Rod Stewart really well and other things too. So, and, and at the time we didn't say it like, Hey, well, let's, let's do some female music. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I think it's time for a male song. We didn't look at it like that. We just said, let's just play music. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's how that basically music is. I mean, it's not, it's not male music. It's not female music. It's music, human music. Yes. And, um, Agreed. and Nancy wasn't, I mean, we met Nancy at the time, but she was not involved in the band. So we, yeah. We she, went out and, she was still at college, right? Yeah. According to the stories. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see her at college. Did you see her at college? You never saw her yeah. at college, though. Yeah, who knows? I heard about I heard stories, about it. Some stories about it. You, know, you never can tell, though. So then we played six, eight months as, and we called the band Hocus Pocus. We were heart before that. We changed it to Hocus Pocus. I don't know why, but because it wasn't heart at the time, because we had all these different players. And the focus was different. So we changed it to Hocus Pocus and we played for six, eight months. And Roger and I, we saved all our money and paid off all our bills. And, uh, and then in, in December, um, we kind of had a powwow and we tried to get the band that we had at the time, Hocus Pocus, to emigrate to Canada to join Mike Fisher, who Anne had actually fallen in love with during the uh, Hocus Pocus time. And uh, the other guys in the band did did not want to go to Canada, but Roger and I did. So we, along with Anne, we emigrated to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and became you know landed immigrants in Canada. And we got up there and started planning and uh, rehearsing the music that we that we were going to play clubs with up there. And uh, we found a Canadian keyboard player and a Canadian drummer, and we just started playing. And within six, eight months, we were um, one of the top bands in Vancouver. And for the next three, four years, we played um, quite a bit of clubs and we toured all over British Columbia and a little bit of Alberta. And uh, we couldn't actually come back to the United States yet because Mike Fisher was actually a draft war protester. So he wasn't allowed back in the country. They didn't have the amnesty thing going yet. So we spent most of our time playing in uh, Canada, which was fine because Canada is very similar to America in a lot of ways. We had to learn the language, but, you know. (laughs) Hey. Oh, like eh? that, eh? I like that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Around that time, you start uh, writing new music, and eventually um, Dreamboat Annie is the first album that comes out of all that. And from what I have read, it took a, quite a long time to record Dreamboat Annie. And Michael, you joined the band around this time. So can you talk about that whole period of, of creating Dreamboat Annie and touring while you're in the studio and, and Michael coming in and all that stuff? Well, most of most of the record was done before I got involved, and I, I just by dumb luck kind of found out that they were that the band was kind of looking for a new drummer. So uh, some people that I worked with, they said, "Yeah, we got uh, we got this these friends of ours are playing this band hard. If you're thinking about maybe joining a band, you might want to talk to them." So I went up and saw them at a club in Seattle, and. Uh, I don't know if you guys all piled in my bedroom and my folks out. Uh, it was Most Roger of, and I and Mike and uh, Ann. Yeah. So they just came to my folks' house. I was still living at home, and they piled in my bedroom. I played for them for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. And Well, so, yeah. at the time, uh, Hart was very famous for playing uh, a lot of Led Zeppelin songs yeah. in, our, in our show that we did at clubs and stuff. And Mike was known as the premier, you know, John Bonham devotee at the time in the Seattle area. And uh, so it just seemed natural that we should get together and see if it would 
work. And did it work? Yeah, it's worked for me. <laughs> I, I, know that. I I started listening to um I'm a little bit younger than you guys. I started listening to uh, pop radio um, around 74, 75. So I was right at the right time to catch the first wave of hearts. And I remember hearing Magic Man and Crazy on You on the radio at the time. So I just got to say, like, from that point on, I, I became a drummer. And Michael, you have been one of the three biggest influences on my playing. Well, it's... Peter Chris, Neil Peart, and Michael DeRozier. So it's an interesting mix, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. One of the songs that I want to bring up on Dreamboat Annie in particular is something that I think is unique in Hart's catalog uh, for many, many reasons, and that's Sing Child. And it's such a great song. It's, you know, it's got that big guitar break in the middle of it it's got weird harmonies it's got a killer flute solo by ann i just want to know a little bit about the put the recording and putting that song together and steve you have a co-writing uh credit on that song uh can you tell us a little bit how that song came about well raj and i you know like we we always fooled around and played stuff together and he would you do this and I do that. And, and we put that, you know, we put all those parts together and they all fit nice. And, uh, and, you know, she's, if she commits to something, she throws herself into it 100%. And, and she came up with her parts and her, you know, the flute part and her vocal part and everything. And I don't know where they came up with that sing child sing thing, mm -hmm. but it all worked. Mm -hmm. So, and oddly enough, uh, Heart by Heart has just learned. We, we don't do the whole song, but we do do, uh, you know, a, a fairly good portion of it. That's good to know. That that now. So since you bring up Heart by Heart, uh, I want to talk about that really quickly. And we'll come back to that at the end. But the two of you have started a band that's playing all of that old great heart music with uh, your wife, Summer Masick, on vocals. How did that come about? And I, I want to know um, like how much you play throughout the year. And is, now that you've added Sing Child, I'm curious to know if there's any other of those old songs that you haven't added yet that you're really wanting to. So, okay, so we uh, basically, Summer and I, when we first, uh, we, we met a night when we were, we were playing a party downtown and Roger and Mike and I, who hadn't played the heart material for very many, many years. And... Uh, we were playing a party and some people requested, you know, three or four heart songs. I think we did Crazy Magic Man and Barracuda. I can't yeah. remember the even remember the game, And so. Summer was the singer that was chosen to 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 play with us or sing with us. So that's when I met Summer. And believe me, there was zero sparks going on at that time. But <laughs> I did respect her her ability and her, you know, I thought she was a together person and uh, she's very nice and she brought an album that i signed specifically to her anyway so we became friends over the next uh months and and uh and then that friendship turned into a romance and that romance ended up us doing a duo where it was a bass and vocal duo and oddly enough we would play like uh, our friends dinner parties and stuff like that and then other people heard about it so then we were ended up doing jam nights at different uh clubs around town and then we did a couple bistros and and then somebody else in uh anchorage alaska heard about it and they called us up called me up and said hey this is a guy we'd worked with before and he said hey uh, i have a show up here um do you want to open up for dwight yoko and we said sure and so we uh we thought about it a little bit and we thought but maybe a vocal, a bass and vocal duo is a little bit light for to open up the show. <laughs> right. So we asked Mike and uh, a, a guitar player that we know by the name of Randy Hansen. You might have heard of Randy. He's a uh, Hendrix artist. He does. Uh, he's one of the best Hendrix guitar player tributes that there are. And he's pretty famous in Europe and you know he does a lot of shows around America, too. Anyway, so the four of us got a set together. 
we were all set to go to Anchorage and then Dwight pulled out of the show because he didn't want to, he didn't want the bus to travel from America through Canada all the way to Alaska. So, so we had, we had a, we had a set, we had a band and we enjoyed playing together. So we kept rehearsing a little bit. And then before long, uh, a opportunity to do a show came up. It was at, and the chauffeur show was a benefit for the Susan G. Komen breast cancer awareness. And at this particular show, there were some uh, people that knew some booking agents. The booking agency heard about us and, and started booking us. We made a website. And through the website, uh, people could, uh, you know, all over the world and basically in America could find out what Mike and I were doing. So all of a sudden, people were hiring us on the East Coast. And, you know, one thing led to another. And we got some booking agents as well. And, you know, and now we play all over America and we play. In Washington State too. So, was your question about songs that we do? We play just about everything that there is to play. I mean, in our set, mm -hmm. we mix in some things, but we have a, a kind of a core bunch of songs that we've been doing for for a while now. But we we are always trying to think what else might work because you know we just want to try to keep it as fresh as we can. But uh, yeah, we're doing pretty much everything that anybody would know. I mean, even deep, kind of the deeper, mm -hmm. the straw wind, that kind of stuff, a little deeper album. Mm -hmm. guys. We just put together High Time. Oh, that's amazing. I have a, a, a question about your set as Heart by Heart, because I, I had no idea you guys were doing this until Alan and I were texting earlier and he mentioned it. And I went, oh, that's really cool. And kind of tongue in cheek, I, I asked, do they do alone, knowing that you guys didn't play on that? And Alan said, well, actually, they do. And I'm curious, what's what's that like to play tracks that, you know, you weren't really involved in writing? But I mean, obviously, there's still a respect for the material there. But kind of what what drove that decision? I think it's really cool for the record. Yeah, well, it, it's if you remember, Alone was a number one song. And um, and before we we even met Summer, that was the very first song that she ever learned by heart. And she was very kind of famous around the, the uh, her our, our area here for singing singing it at karaoke bars. That's so, very cool. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it and it's you know we, being a musician, musicians can play other people's parts. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not yeah. hard. Or it can be hard, but it, this particular song was not especially hard. But we, you know, I think uh, Mike kind of took his part to a, a, another level and uh, kind of brought the whole level of the whole song, up, in my opinion. Nice. Very cool. Thank you. Going back to 1978, can you talk a little bit about Magazine? Because there's a weird story behind that with you started the album. Uh, there was the big blow up with the basically there was a legal action against the label, left the label, recorded Little Queen, had to come back and finish Magazine for the original label. Can you talk a little bit about that circumstance and the and the situation under which magazine was completed man that's a it's it was a mess yeah it was, it was a big it was a mess yeah. we're really glad lucky to be able to get out of that uh record deal that we had with mushroom uh but it was we had to do a bunch of weird things and so it was what what's our our true second album is it magazine is it the little queen that you know it was a it was a mess well, what, what what are we going to do with the songs on that on that record mm -hmm. uh should should anybody play any of the songs i mean it it yeah it just but well, we play them now we play a bunch of those songs yeah what actually happened was we were out touring for and, and backing up uh and promoting dreamboat annie and we come home and we get a couple of days rest and we get a phone call and say, Hey, we got to, you know, come on down to the studio. We're going to work on, you know, magazine or heartless or devil of light or, you know, yeah. one of those songs. So, so in between 
going out and opening up for the Beach Boys and the Doobie Brothers and Charlie Daniels and all, playing all these festivals and stuff all around America in 1976. We were recording that album, which which was and it, you know it was fun, really fun. And uh, but as things were going, I mean, Mushroom, uh, our our management company and our and the record people from Mushroom Records were were kind of flabbergasted. Well, especially Mike Flicker, that the Mushroom Records was not uh, not was not giving paying us uh, the royalties that were due. And they kept saying, well, you know, don't worry about it, guys. We're going to take care of you. It was very frustrating because we were out there playing. We did 150 dates in uh, 1976 from March until December. And as a band, we were each making, we had, <laughs> first we had a gold record. Then we had a platinum record. Then it was a double platinum record by September, October. And we were making $200 a piece each week. Wow. Giving ourselves a salary. Kind yeah. Of thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And unbelievable. Yeah. And, the, and, you know, and we, I mean, we weren't privy to all the machinations that were going on behind the scenes, but we just knew that we weren't getting the the royalties in a timely fashion that we should have been getting. Mm. Uh, that kind of created a riff between the American company and, and us. And there was, we had a little narrow window of we could get out of that. And, and I think Anna and Nancy were mad at the record company because of the way they were promoting uh, Anna and Nancy. So, yeah. Which leads us to Barracuda from what I consider the third album, Little Queen. Everybody knows the story that Ann tells about the situation that sort of inspired that song, but uh, Michael, you have a co-writing credit on that, and I want to know a little bit about how that song came about, how it was assembled in the studio, and um, I want to hear your perspective on the writing and recording of it. Well, uh, that because I was uh, I was lucky enough to be considered co-songwriter on that. Roger and I would get together fairly often. Uh, go down to the to the hall early, and as soon as they had our stuff set up, we would jam a little bit. I'd play, he'd play. And sometimes we'd play together, and uh, you know, come up with ideas a little bit. Uh, seemed like they were concrete enough to be able to put them on tape or whatever. And uh, we did that. It was Barracuda was one of those ideas that just a kind of a groove riff kind of a thing that we sort of started. And Mike Fisher either recorded us. I, I had my little funky uh, recorder that I used to record stuff with too. Somebody gave, uh, probably Mike gave Ann a, a version of what we had and they took it and, and really did a bunch of stuff with it. But it's, you know, it started with the basic riff and uh, so, I don't know. We, then we, we sort of worked out all the bits uh, just all of us, together rehearsing and we used to do that with a lot of song to me it almost seemed kind of like it's that sort of songwriting the arranging and the everybody kind of bringing their parts parts on board that sort yeah. of feels like writing too it just it's very close very gray kind of a gray area there yes uh, well it's not gray you know, to you and i it's no. gray to <laughs> two people in the band of i don't know you're anonymous right yeah now. yeah <laughs> well it's also not gray to Howard Lease because I read one time that he, him saying um, that he, the, the way he described it was Anna and Nancy were very smart about songwriting credits and saying that band input was contributing to arrangements, but not the writing. So that's a fair assessment, right? Yeah, you can you can put it that way, but then you have to define what arranging yeah. and what writing is. And, and, and okay, so what would happen is we get a basic song to work on, and we'd all sit around and listen to it, and then we'd start playing it together. And and then in the, during the arranging part, we would come up with uh, you know design elements that would set the song apart from just being a couple of chords put together, and we just mash it out and just put it out. 
So, and, and we, and we did do design elements and, and, you know, like, a, like for instance, Mike's roles and, and embellishments on the drums and stuff. Well, what, what, when you're a songwriter, you don't think of those things when you're writing the song, you just put these chords together and throw it out there. So the arranging and the design elements and stuff were all put in there by us. And, and, uh, and of course, Roger and, and Howard were the electric guitar players and guitar parts are something else, but they're not just normal, you know, just, Following the riff type ch chord changes, yeah. yeah, they they add a lot to the song. And, oh yeah, uh, and to me, I mean, to me, that's writing too. And you know, and Mike and Roger and Anna and Nancy all got songwriting credits, but Howard and I did not. So, right. Okay, but one, you know, the title song on Little Queen is a full band co-write credit. So can you talk about that song a little bit and how different that situation was from any other song that you did? Well, it, it, it really wasn't that different. It, 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 in, in the process that Steve was just talking about, that, that process was probably a little bit more the focus uh, or, or more the kind of the, the, the end result was more uh, having to do with that process than than a lot of the other songs, but it was still the same process. And and then just sort of threw it, I, as far as I remember, we were in the studio and she uh, she just kind of threw it out there. Yeah, we'll, we'll all be songwriters on this song or something. And, and so, so it felt like a gift to me. It felt like just, oh, gee, thanks. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for the last eight years, but I guess now thanks a lot, you know. Well, <laughs> what I remember, what I remember is she said that and she said, she mentioned Little Queen. And so I took it as we were going to be co-writers on every song. On the album, right. Album, not just that song. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it, 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 they, it, how, what Howard said is exactly right. They were very, they wanted to define uh, songwriting in the old school of Tin Pan Alley sort of, you know, one guy banging on a piano and somebody else barking out lyrics, that's songwriting to them. You got a guy that's playing the chord changes and somebody doing the melody. And, you know, they never wanted to to kind of think that a, a rock band, a structure and the way things were, uh, how things evolved in a lot of those songs were, was actually writing. You know, you could it's, yeah, you could make a claim that it was just arrangement, or you're just playing a bass part, or just playing a drum part, or whatever. But you know, it, you guys know, and I know that in the studio, when things are happening, and it, and a and a song comes in, and it's very raw. Hmm. There's not a whole lot going on with it, and it turns into this thing that that becomes fam really famous and like a like a classic. There was a lot done to that. And so, and we were, but, you know, still royalties, we get, for just playing on the records, we got, we get the artist mm -hmm. royalties for, for that performance. But still, I mean, I think that with a lot of the stuff that we did, um, you could, you could make an argument for what is this exactly? Yeah. Well, so did, didn't Neil Young kind of, you know, he delved into that, deeply in one of his uh, podcast things went into the fact that you know when a band writes a song it's the band writes the song together even, even though somebody comes up with chords and yeah and stuff. I, I think it's an interesting topic it's it's one we discussed quite a lot when we had Gina Shock on the show um, a few months ago and Stephanie, our co-host who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, was in a band called the Aquanettas. And I believe, and Alan, keep me honest, that they actually split all co-writing credits across the mm -hmm. band to avoid this type of issue. Um, right. It, it seems, you know, from someone who's never been in a, a band that's gone anywhere, it seems to be a, a an, an issue that can tear bands apart. And it, it feels like the best way to avoid it 
uh, is really just to try and split everything as equitably as possible. Well, or at least give a little credit where credit's due. You don't have, it doesn't have yeah. to be equal. I mean, right. in of whoever wrote the chords and the lyrics and the melody, that's probably the lion's share. But, you know, I think the rest of the people in the band, they contributed too. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, that's fair. It's understandable. It, it it is a it's a it's a tough call to, uh, but and you really feel like you're sticking your neck out, you know, when you say, "Hey, what about you know a little bit over here for you know, you know, a little consideration over here?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I mean, if you don't do it, because uh, they didn't include me when when uh, Eric Kuda was we were listing the first I don't know how many thousand records went out without me being a songwriter on the on, on Barracuda. Oh, now that I never knew. Yeah. So That's there's some interesting. records out there floating around without my name. Um, but then they corrected it. We all corrected it. And, and uh, it's there. Well, I'm glad it is. Yeah. And I, I felt like, and I didn't want the, the whole thing. I just thought, hey, I was there at the same time that the, the initial germ was was created. And I felt like there should be something for that. You know? Right. Yeah. And, you know, when Hart, uh, when we made songs, I mean, like I said in the beginning, like people came with the chord structure and, and a little bit of melody and words and stuff. And we kind of arranged it, put some design elements into it, recorded it, you know, many, many times and, and worked it, worked it, worked it until it all made sense. You know, we thought, and we were all happy with it. And then in the mixing process, it was uh, it was like a it was like a, another performance because everybody was gathered around the board. Everybody had a fader or a EQ uh, move they had to make during the mixing point. At some point in the song had to you know switch from one track to another or whatever. So it was like doing another performance, just doing the mix. And we and Dreamboat Annie's was actually mixed about 30, 40 seconds at a time. And then our uh, engineer would splice it together. And uh, Mike and I were involved in every step of the, the production and uh, proof of all parts and bits of the music. Yeah, they don't mix like the, the way we had to mix anymore. They, two-inch tape hanging off of a clothesline. Right. Different sections of the song. Now let's use this version. Yeah. <laughs> Put that in there. Well, well uh, Barracuda was actually, um, main body of the song was one take, and the end was another take that we spliced together. Mm. And uh, I think Miss Straw Wind was sort of like that. Too. Yeah, there was a bunch of Flicker used to do that fairly often. Yeah, there'd be one performance where the, this version was great. Yeah. And then another performance of the next verse was better or as good or whatever. So we just, we had no fear of doing that because it all fit together nice. Did you tend to record full band or did you record the, the band tracks and then add guitars and then add vocals or, or was it like a, a everybody performed together? Well, most, most songs we would all play together and then whatever we could keep, we would, we would keep. It was usually just to get a good drum track, but then the, if, if there was a good guitar track going along with it, uh, keep that and just and then keep uh, adding on. Yeah. A lot of the stuff was, the main thing that we were trying to get when we were doing uh, uh, tracks is getting the drum track perfect that everybody was happy with, especially Mike. And then uh, once he gets his track perfect, then we all would would add our uh, overdubs on it. And it was good for me. It was really nice for me because I would be able to take the drum track home for uh, you know, a week to 10 days or so and work on it on my uh, in my little studio at my house and, and then go back to uh, the main studio and then record my part. That's really interesting. Um, th we're recording this show on March 26th, um, just about a week ago on the heart by heart page, you posted a thing about a 45 year anniversary of the California jam show that you guys did in 78. Yeah. 
And that's one of those shows that Hart fans know. I mean, it's kind of an ar- iconic performance. And you were on the bill with Nugent, Foreigner, Santana, Bob Welsh, and a bunch of others. What are your memories of that day? <laughs> that's a joke. That's a okay, joke. good. <laughs> The, the racetrack yeah. yeah 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 we were helicoptered in that was pretty cool because i mean the traffic jam was was way too big to yeah. uh to even worry about so they, we were helicoptered in a lot it, of people it just it, that's my it's just the sea of people they had they had a a, a delayed tower because there were so many people they had two Two PAs, if I remember right, they had, oh, I think they had PAs three. on the on the stage, and then they had a then they had another uh, grouping of of PA stacks columns about halfway back or, mm-hmm. or so. Yeah. So the people, it, it wasn't such a mess and sound bouncing around. It was just mm-hmm. a uh, it was so overwhelming. I have an interesting story. A couple years back, um, a heart by on a heart by heart uh, thread or something, a guy said, Hey, can you contact Ann for me? I was the guy that she looked at, at, at Cal jam. I want to, I want you to ask her if she remembers it. It's like, what? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh, us fans. We're a little insane. Did you guys feel any pressure about playing at the California Jam? I mean, the first one obviously had some really iconic performances from Sabbath and Deep Purple. Coming back and playing for the second one, you know, did the legacy of that first one weigh on you at all? Or did it feel very organic and natural to come in and just do your thing? I mean, there was a to, to this the amount of people kind of just it, it's surreal because you can really only it, you can only see faces to a certain point. Then it's just like a texture. People go, yeah. they're so far in the distance there. But we had done a, a, a fair amount of big shows by then. And uh, that was probably the biggest one that we ever did. Yeah, but We did a lot of stadiums and things like that. It was a lot of people. And so you kind of get used to it. And it's just another day, sort of. In some ways, it's just another. We probably didn't have the the ability for a good sound check so that that sometimes can i i don't think we even got one did we it's hard i can't yeah, yeah. i can't because the way things were run it was it was a lot of uh a lot of groups a lot can you hear of, that yeah okay let's go yeah <laughs> and so that can that can mess up you i mean that can make you a little tense when there's no sound check you don't know what you're you, can, you just sit down and go it's kind of scary sometimes well well one of the things about heart was uh when we played clubs we played a we played a lot i mean we played five six nights a week for months and months and months at a time and then once uh, mike and howard joined the band we still played clubs for a good probably a year before we yeah. started doing the big shows so we we played together a lot and we were very used to going into a room and getting used to the sound immediately so that you can forget about, well, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Well, forget about it. You get, you got this. So you just play with what you have. So, and then uh, one of the things we used to tell each other is uh, when you're on stage, it doesn't matter how big or small the audience is, you're, you're playing to one person at a time. And wow. So that's how I thought of it at, at the uh, Cal Jam too, is it? Well, there's this guy over here. I was making sure that he was happy with my sound, and then you know, it, and that translates to everybody else in the whole audience. And so, then the next thing you know, that one guy, he's harassing you to get in contact with Anne. Whenever you looked at me, <laughs> there, were, there were some uh, incidents that, uh, if you want to, know, if you're curious about things that happened or the potential for things to happen that freaked us out or, you know, that were going to be kind of something to kind of keep your eye on or that might throw you off a little bit. Uh, there was a bunch of those kinds of things that happened to us. And that I just sent a friend of mine a picture of that I had of Kyoto. Uh, we were in Japan playing with the Beach Boys and uh, 
this, you could see the weather moving in. There was a big thunderstorm outdoor gig and, and uh, a big bunch of nasty looking dark clouds moving into the area. And sure enough, by the time we, we just were, I was, I think I used to start even it up by just playing a beat and then I would stop and then count the band in or something like that. Hmm. Uh, I, I just started playing even it up and it had been raining and the, the, the light truss that had these big plastic uh, tarps. tarps and they were just full of water. And you could tell that the weight of all that water in these tarps, and our, you know, people are just kind of, our managers kind of watching to see if it's going to, co- well, yeah, it's going to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> it time. It's coming down. So anyway, I start the song and sure enough, the thing collapsed. Water, whoosh, and, and the, the, the whole thing just sort of went like this, landed right on a, on a drum that I had next to me. And I had a timpani over, sitting mm-hmm. over there. It, the, the, all the tubing from the truss landed right on the edge of that uh, timpani and stopped. If it, if it hadn't hit that, it would have fallen another, you know how, how tall a timpani is, probably three and a half feet, maybe, something yeah. like that. It would have fallen another three feet or so, probably. And crushed his legs. Yeah, it hit me in the head anyway when it came down. But oh, no. Yeah, a bunch of kind of weird stuff like that is, is happening. Yeah, I remember doing a show in Wisconsin, someplace that was outdoors. We were playing away, and I was singing in the microphone, and I looked up, and this a whiskey bottle was flying at my head, and lucky it hit the mic stand instead of my head. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's party. Right on. So speaking of... Um, even it up. The first time I ever saw Heart live was on the Baby Lestrange tour, and that was a really interesting show um, because Roger was no longer in the band, and you've gone from a six piece to a five piece. And the 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 set list for that show uh, was mostly the songs from Baby Lestrange, with some select older tunes that had to be, you know, at least a little bit reworked to a five person lineup instead of a six person. And I'm just curious to know uh, about the rehearsals for that tour and how you decided what songs were going to get included and how you reworked the songs to be played by five people instead of six. I don't know. It's, it was pretty organic really because oh. Howard, like say in magic man, Roger and him could play each other's parts basically. And sometimes Roger would play this part and Howard would play that part. And other times Howard would play this part and, and so whatever so i mean it just it was double duty for howard to do both both parts both uh, and both ends of the part so it seemed like it worked out kind of organically kind of easily to, yeah you do the key parts that really need to be there and yeah. that's just i mean there there's there are a lot of a lot of bands uh, man they they write and record songs in such a way sometimes that they can't possibly be re- reproduced live. And so uh, we never really had it. The, it. Most of the big chunks are, are covered. And we we really are concerned about that now, too. I mean, we want the stuff to come off like it, like it sounds. And th- there might be some detail because of, you know, the overdubs with the acoustic or, or keyboard overdubs or something like that you can't do. But you you got to do the big chunks to to represent. Otherwise, I think people there are certain there's a certain limit people are going to start noticing. But I mean, I I, re, I was just thinking about this uh, Billy Squire, you know, the Stroke. Yes, a big song for him. Uh, I saw I I just heard a song on the radio yesterday, and I saw him live, and the song just didn't come off because so much of what they did with the in the studio was not there. Right. And it just, it just felt empty. And it was like, a, almost like a weird cover band thing. It just wasn't happening. So yeah. we were pretty sensitive to making sure that all the big stuff was covered. I actually play in a heart tribute band. Surprise. You do. I do. We're you called artisans. 
and we we play all the all the big songs as well just like you guys do but we do a lot of deep tracks too and we rehearse on sunday afternoons so i literally came here to do the interview right after leaving rehearsal where we were working on adding mistral wind rock and heaven down to our set list and the situation believe it or not wow i know that's a deep one and Michael, I know that you and Nancy wrote that together. Can you talk a little bit about that song? I, I love the drum part on that song because it's sort of with you hitting the the downbeats, the one and the three, instead well, of the two and the four, it gives that 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 slightly more mechanical feel when it's talking about modern machinery and you know, all that kind of stuff. Talk about that song a little bit and how that came together. Well, uh, I was over at her house. She had a she had a, I think it was an electric piano or electric piano in her basement, if I remember right. And I only knew a, a little bit of keyboard stuff. And that was, uh, that was just some chord changes in that, in that kind of bridge part it goes down to halftime. Do you know what I'm talking about? And in, mm -hmm. in this situation mm -hmm. where it breaks down there, uh, I had just learned that on, on the piano. I used to have a piano in my house. So, uh, a very basic stuff, and she she ended up using it. I think I showed it to her, and she just I kind of forgot about it. And and then it when we got together to arrange that song, it was in there. Mm. So uh, yeah, and then the rest of it, the arrangement, the kind of the oddball stuff, and that again that came up just like a lot of the things we did. Arranging sort of ends up sort of being writing, arranging writing. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I like to call it design elements. We, yeah. we design yeah. specific things to set the song apart from other uh, normal. You're doing the situation. That's wild. I know. Isn't that crazy? I've I've seen a couple of other heart tribute bands. I've never seen any of them do the situation. So I'm I'm pretty proud of us for taking that one on. Yeah. Another one that I really want us to add because I'm the drummer in the band and and I love your drum part so much is Strange Night from Baby La Strange, which is basically all toms. There's no snare. There's barely any cymbal. It's just you wailing away on the toms. And I just love it so much. Yeah, that was uh, the tongue drum that, that you can hear mm -hmm. at the end. That was something that Nancy had in her kitchen sitting on the on the windowsill or something i i just started horsing around on that thing and we ended up bringing it to the studio and i, I, I sometimes i hear it kind of seems kind of a, obnoxious to me a little bit but <laughs> it's different kind of adds some character to it the second time i ever saw heart play was at uh back in central florida we used to have this concert series in the summer that was in a big football stadium and it was called the super bowl of rock and this was the tour after Baby the Strange, but before you started recording Private Audition, and you opened with Strange Night, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah, we've we've have we talked about doing Strange Night? Yeah, I'd kinda, I kind of I don't know why that that song. Maybe it was because it didn't have a strong two and four going on or something. Yeah, it, it's very kind of just it's it's pretty unusual song, and it, I, I think it's a cool song, but. Yeah, well, maybe give it another look. It's not easy to play, though. I have it on my phone. <laughs> For an old timer to play that song, so there's a lot of stuff going on. And... Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, that's well, the truth. High time is, is not all yeah. that easy either. Right. Because it's it's very quick. Yeah, it's, it is. That's one of my favorite songs on Dog and Butterfly. Uh, was, was Summer interested in joining us to talk about Heart by Heart? Let's see. Oh, here she is. Hey, look at that. Do you want, to, want me to scoot over? You want to sit, in the, sit in the middle? Oh, yeah. I get a, uh, this is what I call a Hall of Fame sandwich. Right here. <laughs> Not everybody gets this. Oh, that's right. Exactly. That's amazing. Woo. So, as you guys are, are touring currently with Heart by Heart, uh, Summer, talk a little bit about learning some of these. I mean, you were already doing alone. Uh, talk about having to like take on the the Heart catalog and learning a lot of this iconic music. 
Well, I still am learning. It's uh, it's 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 difficult music, you know. It's um, I I still listen to the songs. It's a lot of listening and the way that I end up learning a new song that we're going to do. And I still find things that nuances that Anne does or just little things all the time. Every time I listen to it, it's like I hadn't listened to it before. So mm. there's always something. Um, there are complex songs, as you would know. I mean, I she, she's you have one, a heart she's one of the best vocalists on the planet. Too, exactly. So it's a tough it is the the range is is it's crazy. So, but um, you know, I I, I learn from it. I surprise myself yeah. of um. Sometimes I think of like, oh, that that song, like for instance, "Cook with Fire" was oh, like. Man. Now I mean we've done it a zillion times, but I was like, wait a minute, that's going to be a difficult song to do, and I don't know that I'm up for it. But I just figure, you know, I got to dive in and just do it. Yeah, so. that's one that my band has has tried to play. We haven't performed it yet because we haven't quite got it the way we want it to sound. Meaning we haven't got it to sound like the record yet, but we're we're still working on it. We're still trying. It is a tough one. It especially is especially the vocals. Right. Mm -hmm. There's an even tougher one we're working on currently. Oh. Thanks to this guy right here. It was his idea. Should we tell him? We were just talking. Oh, you yeah, did. High ahead. time. Oh yeah, love it. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. So I I was talking with Howard the other day, and I said, "Hey, we're, we're learning high time." And he says, "Oh, good luck." <laughs> <laughs> how how is Howard doing? I miss him. Oh, he 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 played a lot with the Paul Rogers. Yeah, and, and bad and company he, for a long time. Yeah, and then he did uh, the rating the rock vault in, in Vegas. And every time I talk to Howard, he says, "Well." Uh, I'm happily retired now. So no interest in being in heart by heart or what about Roger with yeah, any no. of them? He hit the offers there. He said, if you guys are doing any shows in his area, which is Southern California, and you'd like me to join you, that's fine. And he says, if you guys do another kiss cruise, which we hope we do, um, he's going to join us too. Yeah, I was just about to bring that up. I have never been on one of the Kiss Cruise. I'm a big Kiss fan, and I want to go on a Kiss Cruise. And Heart by Heart was announced as on the Kiss Cruise this past time, and I wanted to go so badly, mostly to see you guys, to see Kiss too, but mostly to see you guys. So how was that cruise? And, uh, you know, how was it getting your picture taken with Paul Stanley? <laughs> oh, I mean, horrible. I don't recommend it at all. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, no, the the cruise was just, it exceeded our... Ex it way exceeded expectations. Our expectations, yeah. because I, for one, had never been on any cruise whatsoever. So doing this, mainly, okay, so it's a KISS cruise. It's a music cruise. Plus, we're playing on it. So it's like, it's kind of like a, a working vacay, you know? Mm -hmm. Um it it was fun. Everybody was nice, you know. Uh, music all the time, playing all and, night yeah, long. And, and, and all the musicians, we it was just so fun to meet all the musicians. Yeah, and great every, guys, all of them. And great everybody guys. in Kiss, we 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 didn't meet Gene, but we met everybody else, and they were so gracious and so mm -hmm. uh, so nice to us and complimentary, and and we got to see Kiss perform their show you know four times on the, on mm -hmm. the in, during the five days so it was their their stage show in the big uh, theater was so fun so fun and of course they didn't have any fireworks because yeah well, you know, <laughs> but they had enough confetti and uh, uh they had video walls with fire on it, and it yeah and it, and it was so fun and they were so good and I have so much respect for, for Paul and Gene and uh, yeah. Eric and Tommy, right? Tommy. Tommy yeah. Yeah. So what was the audience reaction to your shows? They hated us. <laughs> no, I think we, we ended up making some new fans we from that cruise. Of, yeah, for sure. it was really fun. Um, yeah, I mean, we played three different stages and each, I mean, there were some fans there, I guess, well, fans of ours, fans of KISS that 
came to every one of our shows. We played three times. So that was nice that they must have mm. liked us from night one that they watched each time. And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm ready to do another one. Uh, I yeah, just, it, it was, was, it was so, so fun. fun. This theater that they that Kiss played in, it, you walk into this thing, you, I, I'm always, I have to remember I'm still on a boat. You, right. You're in this place and it, it looks like a really cool regular theater in there. And, but you're you're on the it's on the the stern the bow stern is the back end right yeah it's in the really bow clear. I thought it was in the bow wasn't it one of them places <laughs> but yeah but it was great a lot of fun so what are some upcoming shows we have one um, coming up on Saturday April first and I'm not joking on that we actually do have a show. Um, there's no fooling around, get it? So, and that's in Everett. So that's like in our neck of the woods in Everett, mm-hmm. Washington. So, and then we're going to California. Um, prior to that, we're going to go and play again in Washington and Gig Harbor the following weekend. But we are going to California on April fifteenth, Saratoga, California. So. Mm. I'm hoping there will be an Atlanta show at some point. I know. We, we definitely want to get down there for sure. Uh, I would love to see you guys. Yeah. We'd love to see you. Yeah. Oh, well, aren't you the sweetest? <laughs> I'm not nearly as big as a uh, heart fan as Alan, but I will be there if you guys ever come out here as well, just to, you know, show some support. Oh, sure. great. Yeah. I do you have a question for summer specifically. Cool. So, you joined Heart by Heart, I think, in 2008 was when, when you were formed. And suddenly you're on stage with two of the members of the original Heart lineup. How was that for you? Was that like mind blowing? Were you nervous or did it feel, you know, kind of natural? Were you at ease? Like, please talk about that. I'm fascinated. Well, of course, I was always nervous. I mean, you want to do well being with original members of heart. So um, I think that's, that's a constant thing I have even to this day performing. I'm not, as, I'm not so nervous cause I really like it and enjoy it. And, um, but you want to put on a good show each time. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I, I have fun doing it. I mean, our band is, we all have a great, um, chemistry and we laugh and joke and but we know when it comes to you know it's stage it's time to work and we're all focused and you know yeah our motto is to play a good show but the next show is going to be better you were talking about uh heart by heart doing some of the deep cuts um just this afternoon i sent anthony a link to heart by heart performing devil delight and I was telling him, this is a really good example of Summer's insane vocals. You just kill that song. And I it's so that good. <laughs> it's great to perform that song. Yeah. I, mean, I don't ever want that out of our set list. Awesome. It's just, it's got a good, good vibe. Yeah, yeah it does. And I, lo- I love playing with Mike on that song, too. Mm-hmm. Talk about the rest of your band um, introduce the other members of heart by heart to our listeners wait do we have the other people oh or wait just... wait who? No. <laughs> so lucy damont um she joined heart by heart in uh may of 2013 to be exact she's coming up on her 10 year um and she was always a um heart enthusiast um a big fan of yeah, heart. yeah big fan of heart um and and studied the music you know just on her own even before joining us and she really brings uh, a lot to heart by heart with all that she does in the band i mean plays she, everything yeah she she, she plays everything yeah. she sings background she drives the bus she fixes my hair no i'm she kidding she does the laundry yeah. um yeah. but she, <laughs> We love Lizzie. Um, and then Chad Quist um, joined us in 2017. And um, he's been a really great fit too. Chad is one of those musicians who can listen to anything and pick it up just like that. Like any song, 
and he'll just okay this is i'm gonna mimic right it's kind of oh yeah. he's so good anything Ooh. we're at rehearsal and he will just bust into whatever i'm like how do you know all these songs you know so well, well he's he was he's been playing uh piano his mom was a piano teacher when he was really young and then he switched to guitar so he played guitar all through junior high school and high school and then he went to berkeley and lizzie went to berkeley also so mm -hmm. wow that's impressive credentials. Anthony, did you have any last questions? No, I think um, I, you were a lot more planned on this than I am, whereas my questions were a bit more off the cuff and reactive. So uh, I think I'm good. This has been really, really fun to talk to you guys. I realize I've been a bit more quiet than Alan, but I've just been sitting here listening and enjoying the conversation. Oh, well, I've had 45 years to think of all these questions that I would want to ask these guys if I ever got the chance to meet steve or michael these are the questions i would want to ask them so. well we can you know we we can put this out and then in six eight months maybe a year we can get together again and have another conversation if you like i, I would love that that would be great that'd be really cool maybe maybe after the next time you're on the kiss cruise yeah. we can talk about that <laughs> there you go i know be nice well uh i just want to let you know that my my band members in hardison's says hi and they they love you and especially this afternoon when we're working on mistral wind what a challenge that song is and um they just wanted to say hi and and tell you how much that they love you so okay, cool Aww. Well, there, right. we really appreciate them uh keeping the music apart alive so thank you so if you if you guys do a gig uh and you do mistral Yes. Put it on your phone or something and send it out to us. It'd be great to hear you. We are we're doesn't... doing we're we're doing uh we're playing in part of a jam next Sunday night and we are playing Rock and Heaven Down and Mr. Wind. That'd be fun to hear. Wow. I will I will let you guys know. I will send it to you. Cool. All right. So people should look for Heart by Heart on Facebook, Twitter, Insta. Where else are you? We have a website, heartbyheart.com. There you and go. That has all of our uh, touring info and videos, video links. And yeah, I mean, you can Google us and find us. Right on. Thank you all so very much for spending some time with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, I have been wanting to have a conversation with the two of you for a long, long, long time. And Summer, it was a pleasure to meet you as well. Thank you. Thank you nice Alan. meeting you too. Anthony. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. This has been great. Have a fantastic night. And I hope all your upcoming shows are great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, y'all. All right. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay. Well, that was an interview with two members of Heart. It certainly I was. And they were pretty cool, I thought. They were they were super nice. I, I'm really, really glad. Um, you know, I've been a heart fan for 800,000 years and, you know, it was just really cool to, to meet them. When I first met you, as far as I was concerned, hearts had precisely two songs and having you as a friend <laughs> has helped me realize that they actually have a pretty good rich discography. So they actually have three, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, they, they were so cool and it was cool to hear about their experiences and, and, yeah. um, you know, really, really cool to get Summer on at the end as well to talk about Heart by Heart. I think that's yeah. really cool. You know, I can only think of one, maybe two other um, examples of where original members of a band have gone on to found another band that's focused on their original mm -hmm. material. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of cool to do that, particularly when well, yeah. they're now playing in smaller venues than Heartwood. So you get a much more intimate experience. Yeah. And certainly with proper heart, having been on hiatus for quite a while now, you know, they, they really kind of, it really started in 2016. They did a tour in 2019. That was it. Mm -hmm. There's been nothing other than that. And they're talking about a new tour in 2024. They've just started, Anna and Nancy have just started that conversation. But, you know, something like Heart by Heart, is that much more important now because you know Anne and Nancy aren't doing this stuff together, right? Ugh. It breaks my no pun intended heart. Hot. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with our picks of the week. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And we host the Watchathon of Rassilon. A podcast where we watch every episode of Doctor Who and then talk to you about it. It's like an idiot's guide to Doctor Who. And where are the idiots? The Watchathon of Rassilon, a Doctor Who podcast made by idiots. And a proud member of the ESO Network. All right, we are back. So, Anthony, what you been listening to this week? Well, I've been listening to a lot of Tony Levin. I can't possibly explain why. Uh, you know, I have no idea. Who knows? Check back on last week's episode, listeners, if you right. haven't heard it yet. Um, so that's really been his whole time with Peter Gabriel. It's been his work with King Crimson. Um, you know, just listening through that groovy, groovy bass that he has. And yeah. oh, he's so good. He's so good. I'm nerding out again. <laughs> He's not even here. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I've I'm been amazed doing... I kept it together when we when we had him on last week, to be honest. Right. I've been doing the same. I have been listening to an awful lot of Peter Gabriel. I just put together a, a big Spotify playlist of all my favorite stuff from Peter's entire career, including soundtrack songs and and stuff that's you know that you don't normally think of from the album perspective and my god what an artist he is and i mean artist in that sense like creating art you know mm -hmm. oh my god and the it, fact it, that tony has been there the entire time just blows my mind yeah and talking to tony you realize just how wild peter's imagination is you know yes. I, I mean i always knew he was absurdly creative but that whole story tony was telling about well let's all be lowered in on platforms by helicopter right. what <laughs> yeah i mean it's amazing but it's also crazy have you ever thought of playing your bass with thimbles <laughs> i think it was the chapman stick it was the chapman stick that's true i mean <laughs> But my gosh, <laughs> I, to have that level, uh, you know, yeah, that is someone who is fiercely intelligent, but extremely creative with it. There are people who are fiercely intelligent, but tend to be very academic right. as opposed to creative. And that really highlighted that. And you when you listen back in the eclecticism of his uh, back catalog of music, yeah, you know, that is not just in his stage show it's in everything he does and the man is always evolving and trying new things and that's what makes him so good as an artist and why you and i have done nothing but listen to peter yeah. gabriel uh, and in my case a bit of king crimson for the last week yes yeah totally all right so we will be back next week hopefully with the whole gang no actually we won't because i won't be here next week because oh, next yeah. week is when artisans is playing our our, our show so it'll be it'll be the three of you. Yeah, we're in the driver's well, seat. We'll have buddy. some continuity week week from week. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> one day we'll have all four of us together again. Um, so until next week, you can find Stephanie Seymour at Bandcamp. You can find her website at therearebirds.com. You can find Stephanie Seymour music on Facebook and you can find her on Instagram at their underscore R underscore birds and you, on all streaming platforms and check out her video on YouTube. There you go. All right. And you can also find our other co-host Rob Levy on juxtaposition over on KDHX. I believe those shows are archived for two weeks on their website. So if you are, not in the area or want to listen back later because you're busy on Wednesday nights. You can find all of that online. I think he also does a show on Louder Than War. And he is also uh, found on the Weekend Justice podcast over on um, needcoffee.com where he also writes. Yes. You can find more of my nonsense at cosmiccreative.com, K-O-Z-M-I-C creative.com. I've got a list of all my podcasts that you can look and find. One of them is a Star Trek podcast, and it's called 
Earth Station Trek. I also have a Doctor Who podcast called Doctor Who A to Z. And Anthony, you want to tell people uh, where you, they can find you? Yeah, you can find me here. All right. <laughs> I like that. That's great. <laughs> All right, so we will be back next week. We will be talking about uh, two to three, wait, two or three hit wonders, bands that almost made it but didn't quite. So join us for that, and we will see you then. Take care, everybody, and keep rocking on. Until next time. Right on. Oh, actually, I should say, just to tie it in with our interview, everybody, take care, have a good week, and keep your love alive. Ooh. There you go. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, see y'all. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.